Now on KGW News, a mind-boggling crash. How a car caught air and sheared off the roof of this house. Plus, every single day I stress, 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 stress. The struggle to get off the streets. A Portland man shares his relief and his story of how he finally found a place to call home. Good night's sleep, no noise or nothing at all, peaceful. And a big development in the mass shooting at a Portland protest. Your news starts now. And good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm David Molko. And I'm Laurel Porter. First at 11, we often report on Portland's homeless crisis, the seemingly endless cycles that land people on the street, mounting frustration from the public, and sadly, the tragic deaths of those just trying to survive. So tonight we're sharing something different. We got a glimpse into the years long journey one man has taken to get off the street. Our Catherine Cook brings us Richard's story. It's late afternoon in Old Town. The sidewalks are busy. Some people are just passing through, but many others call these streets home. There are tents, trash, and tension. On paper, it seems no one here wants to leave. Richard Winkowicz will tell you otherwise after living here. Stabbing, shooting, stealing, all that. For five years. So I got tired of it and tired of it. Every single day, I stress, 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 stress. This corner on Northwest 3rd and Cooch. I camped right here before. Is where Richard lived. He still sells papers for street routes. And across the street, there's Dixie Tavern. He helps the crew here set out cones on busy nights. In return, they give him food and a warm place to hang out. I love the people there. They treat me right, and I treat them respect. There. Yeah, it's Dan. Recently, Richard opened up to a Dixie staff member and said he was ready for a change. I said, John, I need off the streets really bad. I mean, I really do, so I can get my life back together. That got the ball rolling. In the days that followed, multiple people, agencies, and nonprofits stepped in to help. On Sunday, Richard moved in to the Y East shelter. It's run by Do Good Multnomah and funded by the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Here he has his own bed and access to many of the comforts we might take for granted, like a kitchen, bathroom, and laundry. Good night's sleep, no noise or nothing at all, peaceful. Richard still spends his days in Old Town. Mostly my heart, I love helping people out. He checks in on his friends and former neighbors. You want to get your own place and be more comfortable inside and then outside? Yeah. It's not always easy. Christy, would you rather be indoors or outdoors? And it's often frustrating. Christy? Okay, you have a good day. <sighs> Richard notes addiction is robbing so many people's ability to advocate for themselves, to decide they want to leave. Richard says he's been clean for a while now. No more hard drugs. When you're high, you can't think what you're doing. When you're off that stuff, you can think. I can think right now. It just really makes me feel good about where he's going. Dan Lenzen co-owns Dixie Tavern. He's proud of Richard. Dan's a good guy. He hopes others will get a chance at housing too, but there are obstacles. Basic things like getting a proper ID, a cell phone, and even the knowledge of what to do first. It can all be hard to come by when you have nothing. So that narrative of nobody wants to go, that's not right. If we had more outreach, more folks on the ground that day and night, we can't just do it during the day because they don't work around daytime hours. Congratulations, brother. It makes victories like Richard's. It's hard out here on the street. I know. Even more sweet. Yeah, too rough. And Catherine wow. joins us now. Really an incredibly moving story, those interactions with other people on the street. This is somebody who admitted that he needed help, who sought it out, who chose it, who advocated for himself. But it sort of raises the question here, what happens next? Absolutely, David. Well, for those who are helping Richard, the goal is to get him into transitional housing. Last year, between July and December, county programs helped 1,780 people get into housing. So 
people are getting help. Well, we thank Richard for sharing that story of hope. I think we all needed that. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. And another Portland shelter is celebrating success tonight as well. The Bybee Lakes Hope Center, which opened with a few beds in 2020, has now expanded its homeless services program. So tonight on the story, Pat Doris took a look at how they operate a little differently. The expansion means the shelter will go from 126 beds to 318 beds. I went on a tour of the building Wednesday alongside Bybee Lakes founder and CEO Alan Evans. The program here is paid for by nonprofit foundations along with private business, and it recently got a million dollars from the United Way of the Columbia Willamette. It's a high barrier facility. That means that people have to be clean and sober to go into the program. They can stay here for 60 days free of charge. Then they're expected to get a job and pay $250 a month for their space. Evans is very proud of what the program has overcome. And today we are extremely grateful, extremely grateful to say that we finally did it at this building. People said it was impossible. When we first came to this community, we heard that multiple times. There's zoning issues, there's all kind of issues, there's travel issues, there's so many different issues why this wouldn't work. But we wanna tell you is, it's all possible. Evans says 50% of those staying here already have a full-time job within a mile of the facility. He added a majority of people who have gone through the program have moved into stable housing. According to Evans, it costs about $2.4 million a year to run the program. That's on top of the $6 million it took to convert the building. The program recently asked Multnomah County for a million dollars in funding. We're told that no decision has been made on that request. Check out KGW's YouTube channel to see Pat's full tour of the facility and learn more on why Multnomah County is hesitant to pour money into the site. Well, new tonight, incredible images out of Lake Oswego, where police say a speeding car took flight and launched through a home, taking out a chunk of the second floor, including part of the roof. And by the way, that wasn't enough to stop it. Let's give you a look on Google Earth on the South Shore, right on the stretch of Burgess Road going west, where it makes a sharp 90 degree turn to the north. That is to the right there. You see at the driver going at least 100 police say around five this evening instead of making that turn kept going straight. They are now in the hospital, so we thought we'd give you a closer look here right back here in the photo. You can make it out here. Just the fence line. That is the turn in the road. You see the chunk missing because the car came through here and police say it launched up and over this berm. If we can flip to the next photo, you can see this here, not through the second floor, but through the roof over the second floor. The walls are actually still standing here. Wow. And here is what is left the chunk of roof outside on the back lawn. Investigators saying no one was home. Thank goodness, right? But this car kept going, smashed through this wrought iron fence somewhere down here. You see this? You see this big tree it took out? Wow, ending up on its side against the neighbor's back porch here. No word on the cause here, but police say there were no other vehicles involved. The driver suffering serious injuries. No word on his or her condition. Absolutely incredible. Oh, no kidding. Thanks, David. Now let's get you caught up on tonight's other headlines. A mass shooting suspect accused of shooting five people at a northeast Portland park is now in jail. Today, the suspect, 43-year-old Benjamin Smith, was transferred from a hospital into a jail. He'll be arraigned tomorrow. He's accused of shooting racial justice demonstrators at Normandale Park on February February 21st, killing 60-year-old June Knightley. Smith was also shot and critically injured and has been in the hospital until now. Today, well-known member of the Proud Boys, Tusitala Tosi, also known as Tiny, was arraigned in Multnomah County. It stems from a Proud Boys rally last August in Northeast Portland. The rally turned into a violent clash with counter protesters. Tosi's charged with assault and riot, among other things. The DA is asking to hold him without bail, given his previous criminal history. He was extradited from Washington last night, where he was being held on unrelated charges. And one person is recovering after being stabbed on a MAX train. This happened about 1230 this afternoon in East Portland. Portland police say they found the victim near the stop on 148th Avenue and East Burnside. The victim was taken to the hospital and is expected to be okay. As for the 50-year-old suspect, he rode the MAX until 162nd Avenue and was eventually found and arrested a few blocks away. He's being charged with assault. 
U.S. Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown Jackson appeared before senators for a third day of her confirmation hearings. And today, senators questioned her about freedom of the press, about the history of those who are criminally accused to have the right to a lawyer, and about the role of compassion when deciding a sentence. And it tells us that we should be imposing a sentence sufficient but not greater than necessary to promote the purposes of punishment. Congress also tells us that one of the purposes of punishment is rehabilitation. Now, if confirmed, Judge Jackson would make history as the first black woman and first former public defender to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court.